because of our life this morning is from Reverend Michael record our minister and he will bring us the encouragement this morning. Reverend Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you, Van Sajaki. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's a joy to be here on this beautiful Jamaican morning, greeting both those here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica, beautiful Jamaica, sunny, sunny, glorious, glowing Jamaica, and also to those listening online. In this talk, I'm going to do something very simple, but it's fundamental. I'm going to be tackling perhaps the most important question that you can ask about life. Can we control our future? If you can control your future, I'm sure you'll agree. You'll be happy. You are in control. You'll be successful. You will get everything you want if you can control your future. So that's a very, very important question. Before I tackle the question directly, let me give you some background. I've titled this talk, why it works. It. The it is the same it referred to in the first four chapters of the book Science of Mind by Ernest Holmes. Dr. Holmes is the founder of our movement, the religio religious science. In chapter one of that book, Dr. Holmes writes about the thing itself. The thing being the one infinite creative intelligence or mind which is the ultimate source of everything. Creative intelligence, creative mind. It's the source of everything and by everything I don't mean only the physical universe, the things that we see around us. I mean also the thoughts that exist in that physical universe. Your thoughts, my thoughts, the thoughts of all living things. You see, thoughts are as much things as this lectern, those chairs, and this building. It's all ultimately energy. So in capital letters, Dr. Holmes writes on page 30 of his book, there is one mental law in the universe and where we use it, it becomes our law because we have individualized it, unquote. Let me explain the word individualized with a picture. Imagine a perfectly calm ocean, no waves. Let's call that ocean the creative intelligence source universal mind. Now suppose a section of that ocean of intelligence, thought, wanted to appear different from the rest of the ocean. It would lift itself up a foot or two, maybe even 20 feet in a storm, and we would then call that part of the ocean a wave. It's still the ocean, but it has individualized itself and got an individual name, wave. So when we use universal mind, we individualize it and we say, we think. But it's still mind thinking, universal mind. And just as the wave can't ever separate itself from the rest of the ocean, so we can't ever separate ourselves from source. Chapter two of the Science of Mind, that book, is titled The Way It Works. 
And there, Dr. Holmes focuses on how infinite creative intelligence works for us. In his talk last week, Reverend John quoted from Job 22, verse 28, which states in part, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. Unquote. To some extent, that explains the way creative intelligence works. Remember, we are in the chapter, The Way It Works, and that, to some extent, explains it. You see, you speak your word, or you could also say you set your intention if you're doing it silently. You speak your word, and what you want manifests. That is, it comes into being. Now, apparently, mankind has always believed that we can speak things into existence. Look at the evidence found in the oldest book that we all have at home, the Bible. It was written over a period of maybe 3,000, maybe a little bit more, 3,000 years or so. In the first chapter of Genesis, in a creation myth, we read of God actually speaking the universe into existence. Initially, there's just formless darkness. And his first words are, let there be light. Light is created. And over the next few days, he keeps on decreeing, let there be this, let there be that. And the sky is made, and the oceans are made, land is made, and plants are created, and the sun, moon, and stars. After that comes living creatures, birds, and seal, and land animals. And eventually, man is made, all by God's command. We move now to the New Testament, the other section of the Bible, written 2,000 years or so ago. There, there is also a lot about the power of words. St. John's Gospel, you all know how it begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, unquote. And everywhere in the Gospels, we read about Jesus healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, casting out devils, which I interpret as psychological illnesses, fixing deformed limbs, and even raising the dead by just speaking his word. You'll remember that famous command, Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth. Let me go into detail with two of the healings by words found in Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, this is on the mountainside where he gave us the Lord's Prayer and he gave us the Beatitudes. When he comes down from that mountainside, large crowds from all over the surrounding region followed him. Then a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And the Bible tells us immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Notice that Jesus touches the man and then gives the order. But in the next healing, right after, in the same chapter there, there's a distance healing. So clearly the touch is not the important thing. It's the command. Let's look at that second healing. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority 
with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Jesus then expresses amazement at the man's faith and says to him, go, let it be done just as you believed it could. And his servant was healed at that moment. Notice that even while he's exercising the power of his word, Jesus links it to the man's belief. It is done as you believe. Remember that, because we'll discuss it later, the matter of his belief. Chapter 3 of the book, The Science of Mind, is what it does, and chapter 4 is how to use it. The titles tell you what the chapters are. Remember that it is creative intelligence, creative mind. So what it does, how to use it. The, the titles are self-explanatory. But notice that Dr. Holmes does not explain in those chapters why creative intelligence works for us. In this talk, I will explain. And taking that route, I will answer that initial question that we asked of whether we can control our future. The answer to why creative intelligence works for us is, in a word, connectedness. Science, including religious science, tells us that we live in a universe where everything is connected. Logic also tells us that we are connected. Let's go back to that picture of the calm, intelligent ocean. This year, 2019, there will be approximately 8 billion people on Earth. They are being born as I speak. Suppose eight portions of that thinking ocean decided to represent those 8 billion people by rising up and forming waves. All those people, the waves, would still be connected to the ocean and through the ocean to each other. So we are all connected to God, our source, and to each other through that source. What is the connecting substance? Thought. As I worked on this talk, I became aware of the connection that I established with many members of this church long before I started coming here in 1995-96, with connecting with some of those people before the church was founded. We are all here. I think we all extended, ex ended up here, not by coincidence, but because of some mental connection. Each of us is connected to religious science and through it to each other. Religious science being not just the name, but the principles, these eternal principles. My earliest meeting of this group of people I'm talking about with a lady named Carol Campbell. She was up here. She was four years old. She was living, she and her family, the Samuels, were living opposite me, us, our, the record family, on Marion Road, called at around that time Vineyard Penn. It's now Vineyard Town. She and her sister, Pat, came over to visit us one evening. And I remembered quite distinctly looking at Carol four years ago as she sat on a chair in the living room very calm, composed, and thinking, that is the most beautiful girl I have ever seen. <laughs> I, I remember it. I, I see the picture of her to this day. She was very, very calm, very composed, very beautiful. A lot of other people after that, I first saw on stage 
Now, why is it that so many of us are performers? I was thinking about that this morning as I meditated, and the answer came to me. We are all, and this is a government term, we are all in the creative industries. Creative, creative mind, creative in, that's why we are here. These are some of the people that I met before this church was formed. Before, long before I came here in 95, 96. Steve Golding, he was the guitarist in my 1978 to 79 Little Theater Movement pantomime. I remember talking to him on stage, remember it's a stage thing, World Theater stage, about his brother Winston. Now Winston and I were good friends. We were part of a group named the Three Musketeers. <laughs> when we were at Kingston College, so in a way I had started connecting with Steve even before that pantomime. John Scott, I first saw dancing on stage about 1975. He was excellent, he was controlled, he was so graceful. Where's John? <laughs> Shy. I reviewed the show. I was About three years later, he and I started doing transcendental meditation together. So we go back, Reverend John and I, way back then, 78, 79. Noel Dexter, see him up there? I first saw on stage, this was at the UWI Creative Arts Center, conducting the university singers in the early 1980s. I reviewed their concerts. Sandra Cooper, she wrote a column in the newspaper that I used to read and admire long before I met her. Though I may have first seen her, not through the newspaper column, but on stage in a dancing in a review. They used to be in reviews. There we go. Karen Ford Warner, I'm not sure if she's here today. Karen Ford Warner, I first saw doing some wonderful acting on stage in the 80s. Lilith Nelson, Dr. Lilith Nelson, I first saw on stage. I'm not sure if it was at the Ward Theatre in a pantomime or with the university singers. Clive Thompson, I see Clive Thompson there. I first saw dancing on stage at Ward Theater when he was in his 20s. He was incredibly athletic, so graceful. Best dance I'd seen to then and maybe still. And years later, met him again and wrote an article on his entire dance career. It was really like, Tony Henry, Tony Henry, no. I also saw dancing on stage. He was with the Tony Wilson dance crew. Curtis Watson, Curtin. Okay, <laughs> not here yet, he'll, he'll come in later. I first saw acting on stage, acting, not singing, in a play by Pat Comper called The Rapist. Yes, I go to the theater a lot. Last night I was at Basil Dawkins' play. Carmen Clark was working at the Daily News when I was a journalist there in 1974. Dr. Howard Spencer I met in the early 1980s at his brother's Goldie's home in Beverly Hills. Goldie, his brother, was married to my sister-in-law. Courtney Johnson, um, since, since Rhonda is here, I'll just say, I met m my, my then wife, Delia, at St. Andrew. And, 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 and Rhonda was, was a little girl there um, going to, I must have seen her, though I, I never actually taught her. <coughs> Courtney Johnson I met when I was PRO at the Scientific Research Council. Val Shock. I met when she was manager of the band theatre. Lassells Dixon, he sits over there, and I were working together at the UWI in the mid-1970s. I was a university's PR officer, and we chatted together quite often in, in my office. 
Basil Dawkins I met at the same time at UWA, and I've reviewed most of his plays. There isn't another church in Jamaica with so many people with whom I have had these decades-old connections. It's as if we were all destined to come here. But it's not destiny. It's the law of attraction. The law of attraction states that you attract into your life what is in your consciousness. In the Science of Mind book on page 267, Dr. Holmes writes, I quote, man must become more if he wishes to draw a greater good into his life. Unquote. What does become more mean? That's where faith, remember I was talking to you about faith. Jesus said, talked about the man's belief. That's where faith becomes. You become more by becoming, by having more faith, by believing more. You've got to have faith. We can go by Jesus' very simple one sentence explanation about faith. It is done unto you as you believe. Unquote. Or we could go to these longer paragraphs by Raymond Hollowell in his book, Working with the Law, page 67. I quote, <coughs> The mind is a magnet and attracts whatever corresponds to its ruling state. Whatever we image in mind, whatever we expect and think about, will tend to bring into our lives the things and conditions that are in harmony therewith. Science has convincingly proven the existence and constant operation of the law of mental attraction. For this reason, everyone should be doubly careful about how and what he thinks. Our predominant mental attitude is the primary cause of most everything that comes into our lives. And the sooner we, we realize this truth, the sooner we shall begin to improve our lives and progress." Unquote. A key word in that paragraph is expect. It's a very good synonym for faith. Hollowell tells us we don't get what we want. We don't get what we wish for. We don't get what we hope for or pray for. We get what we expect. Same thing as faith. He's echoing Jesus, just using a different word. We must expect what we pray for will happen as strongly as we expect the sun will rise tomorrow. That's how strong our expectation should be. We know the sun will rise tomorrow. We should know that when we pray, we, when we set our intention, it's going to manifest. And it will. It's a law. I think that this spiritual man treatment captures the process perfectly. It has an epigraph by Ernest Holmes, which is this. If we give a treatment without a definite motive in mind, the most we can accomplish will be to promote a salutary atmosphere, unquote. So he's telling us there, when we set our intention, be definite. When we pray, be definite, be clear. So the spiritual mind treatment following that epigraph is titled <clears throat> I'm clear about my good here it is the one mind has within it all that ever was is or shall be it is without limit re restraint or boundaries of any kind everything is possible and plausible to the infinite creator it am compasses everything without any concept of time, space, or size. It is the stuff of which I am made. I have total access to all of it 
by means of my conscious intention. Knowing the perfect process of spirit requires a clear image to do its work. I now take on the process that gives form to my reality. I state my desires clearly, concisely, and with a powerful sense of how it is I want my experience to be. I leave the how and the means to spirit which has far more avenues than I could ever imagine. I know what the outcome will be because I have explored in my conscious mind the qualities of my desire. In gratitude, I accept the good, and so it is. That's by Reverend Linda Finley of Petaluma, California. By now, we have answered the questions we began with. Can we control our future? And why is it that the working of creative intelligence assists us? <coughs> Let me summarize. We control our future by speaking our word, by using words, or by setting our intention. And we do so with faith, feeling, and expectation. And the reason speaking our word works is that we are connected to the creative mind by thought. So when we think or speak, creative mind responds by creating just what we demanded. That's it in a nutshell. But I want to close by explaining how we can go to the level above having our prayers answered having our hopes and dreams realized. The level above that. You wonder if there's a level above that, yes. I want to move to the level where the world automatically, without any speaking or praying on our part, works for our good. That level is what Deepak Chopra calls in his book by the, of the same name, the spontaneous fulfillment of desires. It just happens automatically. That's where we want to reach. We don't have to pray, we don't have to set it. The word just works for us. According to the Bible, to reach that level, we must love God. How do I know? Look at Romans 8, 28. It states, all things work together for good for them that love God, unquote. But what precisely does it mean to love God? Love is, you might be thinking, abstract. But in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus shows us that love is action. Action that helps your fellow man. Remember the story, I know. A lawyer comes up to him and asks him how he can inherit eternal life. Jesus asks him, what does the law say about the matter? And the man gives this beautiful answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer, you know lawyers, he wants to justify himself. <coughs> That's a word in the Bible. He wants to justify himself. And he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Then comes the parable. Jesus tells him the parable of the Jew who was going down from Jerusalem to Jer Jericho. He was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. And other Jews, including a priest, passed by and ignored him. Then a Samaritan, a man from a group that Jews didn't really like to associate with from Samaria adjoining, 
came by and saw the man and took pity on him. He bandaged the wounds, pouring on oil and wine, put the man on his own donkey, carried him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he gave money to the innkeeper to continue looking after him and said, When I return, I will embarrass you for any extra expense you may have. Unquote. Jesus turns to the lawyer. Who do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The lawyer replies, the one who had mercy on him. <coughs> Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Essentially, Jesus is saying that loving God means loving our fellow human beings. Let us too go and do likewise. Namaste.